So hi everyone and welcome. Today we'll be talking on the paper by some of the DeepMind folks. Uh, it's called Large Scale Retrieval for Reinforcement Learning. So this paper was really interesting to me because I have also been thinking about a framework to use memory to boost the learning process. And actually whatever they did in this, uh, in the experiments that they did, showcase that there's actually a use of using memory to actually aid the learning. In fact, the outcome of using memory, which is to play like a goal game, a nine by nine goal game, led to even more powerful agents as compared to just using like Monte Carlo tree search. So the use of memory as a way to like infer from similar experiences is something that can be leveraged on in order to improve reinforcement learning agents. And this is really cool because typically for reinforcement learning agents, what we usually do is like in the beginning, we did tabular cases whereby, you know, you have like some states and then you retrieve like some value. So this is like Q learning. So this is a tabular approach. Usually the memory is like more like related to states itself. All right, but it, you don't really leverage on like nearby states, similar states, like what's their values or like what's the actions. And like once you go to the neural network approach, the neural network approach will be similar. You actually like keep input in a state and then out comes like a list of values, state and outcomes value. So this is the typical method. Okay, what actually what I advocate more is like you don't really use values, but you just predict straight away an action. So again, all these things, right? If you were to just do this, like there's very famous models on that. It's called actor critic, all right? Where you do something like that. One of them does the critic, which is the value. One of them does the action, which is the actor. So these are the more common reinforcement learning agents right now. And all this, usually the form of memory they use is in the neural network weights. Okay, even for like this Q learning case, even in this tabular case that you see earlier here, this Q learning case, when it actually goes into the neural network to do like, basically when they basically made the tabular thing more generalizable, it is still using a neural network typically to encode like the value from the state itself. So like this state over here, you put as input to the neural network and outcomes here, this, this value will be out, output over here. So the memory that we typically talk about in neural networks, is in the weights, okay? So this is quite interesting because right now we incorporate another form of memory that is not in the weights, all right? So, so you ask, uh, does DQN use replay buffer as memory? Okay, so in that sense, yes, it is a form of memory, but for DQN, the replay buffer, what we normally do for the replay buffer is to sample transitions from the replay buffer and then use these transitions to train the neural network. So actually it's not really a form of memory. Uh, like it's not really a form of like memory that you like directly pull out and use the memory. You actually use it to train the neural network and then later use the neural network for inference. So it's like a two-step method. It's just a more uh, efficient way, I guess. They call it efficient way to train your memory. Although the initial formulation for DQN, the memory wasn't that efficient because they did random sampling. After that, they did stuff like prioritize sampling, which was a little more efficient. But I think the most efficient will be if you go through the entire episode and then you do one by one the transitions from the end to the front, like hippocampal replay. That will be the more efficient ones. But it suffers, it, it suffers from this thing called the, like if you have too many transitions of the same episode, maybe you will suffer from some like local optima. So people have not really done stuff like that. Yeah. So actually my, my latest work that uh, I've submitted for a conference basically talks about how I can use, uh, how we can use memory in order to like learn from this. Like basically we can use memory as a way to like predict the future outcomes. And then we can use that to form our optimal actions as well. It's slightly different from replay buffer. Yeah, so I won't be talking too much about my work. Today, I'll be focusing more on what this paper did for large-scale retrieval of memories. Okay, let's take a look at what this paper does now. Okay, so before we begin the paper review, 
let's think about this question. All right. Imagine you are a reinforcement learning agent. You have a neural network that takes in some inputs and comes out an output or um, some outputs. Okay. Let's say if I were to give you a new example, like for example, all along you've been walking through, I don't know, I'll, I'll use a canteen. Okay. Let's say you all along you've been going to the science canteen and then you see that there's no, like, there's no chicken rice there. Okay, let's say chicken rice again. Suddenly, one day, you walk through the science canteen and you see a chicken rice store there. Of course, it has some associated reward or some associated value with it. And if you see that one observation, how can you incorporate that observation into your memory if you were a neural network? Can you think about that? So if you have a neural network like that, okay, so maybe the output here is whether or not is it like, uh, is it chicken rice? Yes or no. So maybe it's a binary output. Chicken rice, yes or no. One or zero. And then your input here will be like science canteen. So how can you store the fact that the science canteen now from no chicken rice, it becomes, a, has a store of a chicken rice. Any of you want to try? Like how would a neural network do this like memory encoding? Okay. Back propagation. So we say back propagation. Uh, yes, that's that's indeed correct. So we actually do back propagation. We basically do like from the output, we have a loss function. Okay, so in this case, like the loss function, it could be because this is like a classification problem, we could use this uh, cross binary cross entropy. Yeah, which is the basically the the p log q kind of thing. Yeah, it's basically the sum of uh, negative p log q where P is like the predictions and Q is the actual ground state. So you can use like this as a loss function. We can back propagate this one all the way back and we can update the relevant weights. Okay, so this has been the dominant approach because like in, in stuff like multi-layer perceptrons, we do this, like we can do back propagation over multiple layers. Okay, however, if you want to learn it fast, all right, you may not be able to learn it that fast because backpropagation is like across many samples. You know, why do you think like supervised learning needs to go through so many batches, so many epochs in order to train your network? Because one single sample is not sufficient to like tilt the weight so much that you will forever like, let's say you see the science canteen has chicken rice store one. It, one sample of this may not be sufficient to change all these weights here such that your output will always be a one from a zero. Okay, you might need to go through many, many different samples. And that's why it can be quite uh, time consuming and lengthy to change a neural network weights. Worse still, okay, worse still, you have two different outputs. Like you have another output here, one zero, maybe this is the presence of a Japanese store or Japanese food store. Okay, if you change this set of weights here, this output here, okay, might be altered, altered, you know, if you update weights, earlier stored relations may be altered. So this is actually not that great because like it leads to some form of like not so reliable retrieval of like memory from the neural network weights. So this is why I strongly feel like the neural network is only one part of the solution. You cannot just use your neural network for everything because neural networks are good at pattern matching, but they're actually quite a bad way to store memory. <laughs> I mean, look at like, you change the weights a bit, you might change the outputs of some other examples that you don't even want to touch. Okay, so this is not really the focus of this paper, but the idea is that neural networks are very slow to actually learn a new relation. So what are the kinds of memory we can use? Okay, I mean, in, in those kind of like cognitive science or psychology, there are other memories like working memory, declarative memory, procedural memory, yeah, semantic memory, those kind of things. Are that I, I would treat them as like artificial delineations of different memories. But in terms of like what we can actually do, like in terms of computer programs, I would rate them as two different kinds. One is the kind which is in the neural network weights. The other kind is some form of external storage, whereby we can retrieve these memories and use them in the neural network. Whereas this is some pictures to illustrate this point. So for instance, we have one memory, which is like, this is the neural network kind of memory. And over here on the right is like external storage. This may not be how it works in the brain, but the idea is basically similar. You have like external 
database and then you reference the database for some ideas or some information and then you use that information for some data processing. So this basically is like two different kinds of memory. One of them, the neural network is fast. The other one, the memory retrieval, like maybe from based on similarity. Again, you can use something like a transformer. That's why a transformer works here. You have this thing called a query, key and value. So you have stuff like that, query, key and value. So your database would store like all the keys and values. And then what you do is you want to query this database in order to get some information from there. So this query over here, it, it could be quite slow because like you maybe have 1 billion entries, you need to query one all at a, all, like every single entry we need to query and find out what's the best uh, like entry to take out. Okay, but with some approximate techniques that I'll be touching on later, you can actually make this quite fast. Okay, so you can actually query the top like n neighbors pretty quickly with some approximate inference techniques. So this actually, if you use those techniques, this actually can be a considered fast. Okay, let me just write this down. Fast with right approach. So you can actually get the stuff from the memory much faster. Okay, and the disadvantage of a neural network is that it is slow to learn. Okay, it requires multiple gradient updates. But for this external, like hard, external, like call it hard disk or external memory, you can just put in the memory or you can even remove the memory like very quickly. You just need to remove that entry in that in, in that key value table. Okay, but uh, this paper did not really do this uh, adaptable and learnable memory, which I think it can be definitely a follow-up in order to make agents learn better. Okay, you can make the memory more suited and adapted to the environment that the agent is in. All right. Any questions so far for this uh, distinction right now? Before I move on to the next slide. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I I tell, I, I think it maybe it's uh, it, it, is it right to think of it as kind of trade off because, uh, in terms of the the, the speed and the the, the integrity because you mentioned that in the neural network case right when you want to learn something new you, you might alter some already stored information right from the example you give. Yes. Isn't that exactly because you use the entire model as one entity to store everything, whereas for storage, like storage device, right, different information are stored in an isolated manner. Uh, and that's why exactly that, I think that also that's also why we retrieve it from the like like a like a hard disk, right? It takes longer time because you search through in general you search through all the isolated cells cells uh like, yeah but whereas in you know since you store everything just in one place just one forward pass you yeah definitely yeah that's that's definitely one of the reasons why neural networks are much faster but you are saying that if you isolate your neural network you can get the same kind of memory that without without adapting the other memory is it is that what you're saying if you use two different networks you can not affect each other is it not sure. Have you heard about this 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 uh work called progress net? So basically, the idea really, yeah. idea the idea is to uh stack different models together, but for different tasks, right? You train like for different subset of data, you train on different sub subset, not subset like a, a different blocks in your model. Then obviously, uh. Like one, when you train on one subset, a uh, sub the block of the model, it will, will not affect other blocks, right? So it kind of gave you some trade off in preserving the integrity of data. Mm, yeah, I guess if you do some because if you if you yeah. do update every time you do the update, only a the the backdrop only affect only one block. It's like a Lego, you stack different uh, models together. Then for some subset of data, you only affect only one block. So, it, so you kind of uh, mitigate the problem of uh, affecting other tasks, right? So they use this technique to uh, mitigate things like catastrophic forgetting. Yeah, possible. I guess if you implement this like hard structural constraints to prevent memory overwriting of like neural network weights to affect different outcomes, you can perhaps mitigate the issue. But the issue will still be there because like for that particular block of the network, whatever you adapt, whatever weights you change, it will adapt that block. And then 
it may not be basically you, you won't get like the very reliable kind of reading. Yeah, of the yeah that, that, that's why I say it's a trade off, right? Yeah, correct. So it's a trade off. What you, what you say is right. There's ways to mitigate the trade offs. There's ways to actually do a middle ground between both of them. Like what you said, the progress network, maybe, maybe it's a middle ground. Yeah. Uh, in fact, in brains, usually what we do is we probably tend more towards the left side. We, we might actually use this kind of structure to do retrieval of memory as well, but maybe more like distributed ways of retrieval. Yeah. So because, <laughs> you know, it's been shown in studies that like when you recall different events with the, the different emotions, sometimes you're, whatever you, when you recall, your state of mind might actually infuse more details inside that memory. So it's been also shown that our memory is not stable. It tends to change as we recall it. So it might actually be that our memory is this kind of neural network structure rather than like a hard disk where you have different ent entries. Okay, but that doesn't mean that the biological form of memory is the best. Okay, I mean, it might just be a quirk because nature does not have this kind of hard disk-like stuff to, to tweak around with. Yeah, so my take is that although nature is more towards the neural network side, but in terms of more sta stable and like reliable kind of implementation, we should re we should implement it more like the hard disk style. I mean, DNA is sounds more like the hard disk style, right? very reliable. All right, but DNA is not exactly the memory. You see, you still need to encode the memory somewhere, which is probably in the synapses. I mean, that's what the long term potentiation. Um, Eric Kandel and Lynch, some of the biologists, psychologists have found out that like um, how strong your synapses actually can encode like the memory state itself. Like the distributions of all this could be the memory. Yeah, so I would say that biological stuff is still more like this one, but in but I, I still stand by the fact that like this may not be the best. Yeah, uh, this maybe is more practical. I put a P. Yeah. But you are right in saying that both have their pros and cons. Yeah, but, but do you agree that there's some advantage in using this kind of hard disk like memory in terms of uh, using it to extract in, relevant? If you want more, if you want yeah. more reliability, definitely. Yeah. And not just reliability, actually it learns faster in some sense because you can just insert the memory inside this hard disk. But doesn't mean the infant time is Faster. Uh, the inference time will be slower if you use this kind of hard this kind of memory. Even if you use, even if you use approximate techniques, there's some overhead in terms of the algorithm. Yeah, 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 that's what I'm talking. About. Yeah. So yeah, definitely some trade offs. Okay, I think that's a good discussion. Let's uh let's continue. Okay. All right. So this is the main way that the paper did to augment the like information from an agent. So basically what they do is they take in, all right, the, the input here, this is the agent input. Sorry, the agent observation will go through. Usually the agent observation will just go through like this kind of framework. But if we actually augment like the observation, you encode the observation into some latent space, okay? And then you use the data set and then in that latent space, you find the nearest neighbors in that latent space. You can then associate like n neighbors and take their data and use these n neighbors to actually also help to predict the model outputs. And in this case, the model, what the model predicts is like the policy, which is like the action given the current state itself. Okay, and then this one is the values, which is like the values of, of that maybe of, of maybe of the current state. So this policy and value it really depends on what you want. Okay, over here, they have a policy and a value network because um, the agent here is something like alpha zero. Actually, it's mu zero. So they have a policy and a value network, All right? So you can also condition this on future actions, which is basically like, because when they actually take these observations, it's actually from a, a game itself, a game of goal maybe. You already have like the whole trajectory. You take all the future actions of all the next few actions all the way until the game ends. All right, so given a certain state, condition on the future actions of maybe this, this um, current trajectory, what is my policy and what's my value? Yeah, so this, this is something that, um, that has been done in this paper. Yeah, I feel it's a little complicated, a bit unnecessarily complicated. I'll explain why I say so near the end of this presentation. All right, so the main thing that you need to know is that 
usually the workflow is just the observation goes to the like output after being processed. Here we augment the observation with other neighbor kind of observations like this one over here. And this later through some empirical results has been shown to be superior to not doing this. So there's some use for memory augmentation. All right, so let's take a look. So what are the concerns, okay, if we use memory to do this kind of retrieval? Why or why, I mean, why, what will be the key factors that will cause it to fail? All right, there are two main concerns, actually. The first concern that we need to solve is that we need to have a scalable way to select and retrieve this data. Because if we don't manage to scale, then when your memory is very big, billions or trillions, you will have a hard time extracting the memory fast enough for inference in real time. Okay, so if it doesn't scale that well, using this memory approach may not be the best one, right? So the second thing is after you collect all that data that you have retrieved from memory, how do you use it? What's the way, what's the robust manner whereby you can use it without really affecting your performance? Like, because sometimes your data that you retrieve might be bad, all right? So how do we mitigate that? So we need to have a robust way of like doing some form of like selection of your data and so on. So these are the two key things that um, this model would need to solve. So let's take a look at the first one, a scalable way to select and retrieve the data. So the way that is done in this paper for the memory selection is that they actually use a transformer-like architecture in the sense of the attention, all right? So again, as what I said earlier, you have a key and a value in your memory. So your memory stores the key value pairs. Okay, these key value pairs will be like, for example, in the goal game, the key will be the bot state. Okay, and the values will then be like the embedding space. Oh, sorry, sorry the key in this case, in their paper, the key is, is the embedding space of like the bot state. And the value will be basically the associated metadata, okay? Which is, which is like the future moves and like maybe you win or lose that kind of thing. Yeah. So, 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 so in this case, we are matching the key, which is like the bot state in some embedding space. And we are trying to get the value, which is the metadata. And the observation, what we are doing here is we are doing the observation, which is the query will be the, the current data itself, all right, in the embedding space. So all of this will be transformed in some embedding space. Let's call this embedding space G. So you transform this into an embedding space G, both of them through the same embedding space G. And then over here, this is why I call the latent space. So we actually need to compare, let me just write this here, compare the query and key in some latent space must be meaningful. Okay, and then we can compare the similarity using some metrics. Okay, so use, use some metric to compare similarity. So what is this metric? All right. So later we'll, we'll again think about like how can we figure out whether or not the query is similar to the key. All right. So this is the key idea uh, behind the, the, the way that we do it. So over here, you can already see like sort of the, the answer. <laughs> the answer is some inner product. Some somewhat like a uh, transformer, you know, transformer, you do q.k, right? Yeah, if, if you all remember the transformer architecture last week or two weeks ago, we're talking about chat GPT. So uh, the transformer architecture can match the query to the key using a dot product. So this is a similar way of, of getting it, all right? So one thing to take note of is how do we do this embedding space G? So G in this paper is a pre-trained embedding layer, all right? That is basically, they took the training data set and they used the training data set without the memory augmentation part to match to the values, which is the policy and the value network. And they just took the final layer of one of the rest nets as the embedding space. So it's, it's basically saying that the first few layers of the neural network, so this is the, the neural network, right? That used to process the data. So this is the input and then here is output. So you have a neural network that process this data. And then what you do is you take almost the end layer 
the near the end layer, you take this slice here. And this slice here will be your embedding layer. Okay, not just that, okay? They not just take that slice there as the embedding layer. So actually, this reminds you of word embeddings, right? Yeah, it's actually very similar to word embeddings. Word embeddings also you take, after you process, after one layer of transformer, you take that, that uh, vector and that's your embedding layer. So you take that embedding layer and then what they actually did even further, I'm not sure whether this step is necessary, but they didn't do ablation studies without it, but they actually took this embedding layer and they do some technique called PCA. So PCA stands for Principal Component Analysis. So it basically maps the data into some axis, principal axis that explains most of the variance. So with PCA, you can get like samples that are very well spread across the axis because this explains most of the variance, this axis. So you can get quite well separated data. So it's not too sure whether the initial embedding layer, is it good enough? But for the paper, they had to do PCA as well. So I suppose the initial embedding layer may not be the best way to represent the data. You still have to use PCA to spread it out, right? But either way, this G is a combination of the embedding layer plus the PCA. And this basically helps to form this latent space over here, okay? Which basically you can use to compare how similar the memory is together. So what is the way that, what's the algorithm that they use to get the memory? So this is quite important. So they actually use this memory architecture called the SCAN. I can't remember the full name or the full name that is this acronym, but the idea is that you retrieve, you know, this and each entry will be mapped to a key vector, okay, which is done using G. Okay, G is the one that maps your input space to your latent space that you do the comparing of your memory. Okay, actually, if you think about it, this G itself, right, is like your transformer architecture. You go through some linear layers, remember? You go through some MLP layers before you do the query key uh, value kind of attention. This is somewhat like the MLP for transformers. Yeah, so this is something like the multi, somewhat similar. So you can see that the transformer architecture is uh, actually got a lot of these things right. So it's quite amazing that, that you know, transformers, although it was first unveiled five years ago, is still in use right now. So transformers got a lot of these architectures correct, right? So next we have, Okay, we retrieve the entries with the lowest squared Euclidean distance between query and key. Okay, which is also basically, it's very, very similar to transformer architecture because if you do like q.k, you are actually taking the, the like, it's sort of like the, the, okay, here it's not exactly q.k because q.k is, you take each of this, like over here, this is like, let's call this q1. Okay, I'll just going to do it for Q, Q1 and Q2. So Q1, Q2, and then this one will be, oh, actually I realized I drew it wrongly. So let's redo this again. So if you were to do like dot product with like only two, uh, two elements to your dot product, this will be Q1, Q2, and then the key will be K1, K2. Okay, so this actually is the same as yeah, I'm just going to write it with text. Okay, Q1, K1 plus Q2, K2. So this is like the dot product, right? the similarity. But if you were to do like Euclidean distance, what you will get is something like that. You will get this Q1 minus Q2 squared plus K1 minus K2 squared. Okay, so it's slightly different from like the dot product. Okay, so this, um, this Euclidean distance, it's not exactly like, like in inner product, but it's actually related. Okay, so because this, if you're this Q1, K1 plus Q2, K2, I guess if this one is very high, then this one here would be very small. So yeah, let me see whether I got it wrong. Q1, oh, sorry, it's Q1 minus K1. Yeah, let me, let me rewrite this again. Hang on. So Euclidean distance is like that. Q1 minus Q K1 squared plus Q2 minus K2 squared. Yeah, so if let's say your Q1 and Q, uh, K2 are very close together, your Euclidean distance will be very small. Similarly, if your Q1 and K2 are very close together, this one will be very high, which means very similar. So if your Q dot K is very high, it means very similar. So 
this is the dot product and this is the Euclidean distance. Okay, I'm not too sure which, uh, why like, why we do certain, like why, why do we want to do Euclidean versus why do we want to do dot product? So that one needs more investigation, but both methods would tell you like how similar it is because if your Q1 and K1 are very similar, your Euclidean distance will be very low, but if your and your and your this dot product will be very high, yeah. So it depends on the kind of metric that we want to use, okay. But there's a very key property uh, behind why. Okay, let us go over here. Okay, why this is used. So if you look at the scan architecture, actually they are actually doing reconstruction loss. So they have proved in their paper that the squared Euclidean distance is similar to the reconstruction loss. Okay, of a particular like particular value query that is like placed at maybe position X. So like this distance between the two like the two representations, if we just take the squared Euclidean distance between them, it is the same as the recon or it is similar to the reconstruction loss or maybe this point Q being transferred to the point X. Okay, because they actually did some form of quantization and then they want to see like what's the quantization error. That's the main aim of this paper. Yeah. So yeah, so you said that what dot product is basically cosine similarity, which is used for text. Uh, yeah, dot product is cosine similarity. Uh, it's not just used for text. Okay, it's used for a lot of other things right now. Also, basically the transformer model, the attention mechanism uses dot product. Okay, but there's nothing stopping it to use squared Euclidean distance to compare similarity as well. Okay, it's just a different way to compare. And uh, why people use different ways? That one. I'm not too sure. Okay, that one have to do further research. But the idea is that as long as you can find similar neighbors for the memory mechanism, as long as you can find similar neighbors, that's good enough. You want to use dot product, you want to use squared Euclidean distance, as long as it achieves the aim. All right, we can leave the mathematicians to do some theoretical proof to see which is better. Okay, but I think it's, it's actually related. Okay, so next we have the retrieve. Oh, sorry. Next, what we do is we retrieve this memory it's X. Okay, with a lower squared Euclidean distance. So you can see over here, like let's say this is the radius here, all right? So as long as the memory itself like falls within like a, a certain uh, squared Euclidean distance, it is a very similar memory, which means it's something that we can use. You can see like the closer you are to like the query or the closer you are to like this X, okay, this is actually the more closely related ones. Okay, then we can ask ourselves also like, you see, this is like a ball, right? Okay, I mean, why why do we not do like absolute distance then? Why do we want to do squared Euclidean distance? I mean, have you, have you thought about that? Like if we do absolute distance, okay, then it's like if we perturb it like this direction, like that, plus this direction, like maybe this is three and this is two, your memory here should be like of the same perturbation as your memory here. Like, so like, why why do we not do like like absolute value? Okay, this is something that I asked myself just now. Why not absolute value of the vectors? Yeah. So I think it's similar to like why in a best fit line, you know, in your mean square error, why your best fit line like a linear regression? Why do we not like normally use mean absolute error, but why do we use like the mean square error for best fit line? Okay, it's probably to penalize very extreme changes in your value, okay, which would probably mean that your meaning has been shifted rapidly. So again, this squared Euclidean distance might be just a proxy okay, in order to like preserve your memory by penalizing very large deviations away from, away from the line. Uh, so you mentioned differentiability. Mm, mean absolute error can also be differentiated if you like express it. Okay, I, I guess yes, uh, because like the it's not differentiable at that point, uh, like at a zero point. Maybe that's why people don't use it, but we actually have a way to differentiate mean absolute error in neural networks as well. So I don't think differentiability is the, the key. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you can just basically do some adaptations to mean absolute error to make it differentiable. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I believe the squared Euclidean distance here is used because this basically penalizes large deviations in any of the vector spaces, in any of the values of that vector. 
And this actually means that the, the values that you retrieve will be very, very close to your original memory itself, or original observation itself. So as a, as a comparison to see like what is done, you can see like this has been done for the goal game. This is the original board. You can see that this over here is the next action that the original uh, bot chose. All right. So what we do is we then query neighbors to see what are the different kinds of actions that we can choose as well. So like you have one neighbor that choose the same one. Okay. The action over here, you have another neighbor that chooses the action here, over here, another one that is over here, but different like trajectories. Okay. So whether or not we need to store all this full trajectory is an open question. I don't think you need to. But for this architecture, they stored the, the whole list of like trajectories all the way to the end state. And also whether they win or lose. You can see like over here, this green one means win. Okay. And over here, this white, white red one means lose. All right. So you can see that perhaps this, this, this outcome here is actually a bad outcome. So if we hadn't used the memory search, we would have chosen an outcome that probably would have lost the game for us. But if you had used your neighbor search, you could have found this other tree neighbors here that would win the game okay but not all the time okay you 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 can put here you can also lose the game if the opponent like responds here so yeah this is just an example of like how the nearest neighbors could be used to like radically change the outcome of your decision okay because you might extract more neighbors that tell you to do a different kind of move and then overall when you concatenate them together you will see the procedure later, but when you combine the inputs together from all these neighbors, together with your original observation, you might actually change your mind. Okay, how I treat it is like that. Okay, you have an initial way of like doing something, and then you're not too sure. So you are asking your different council members, hey, uh, what do you think about my decision? Then each of them give you their inputs. Then you consolidate all these inputs, and then out comes your own input. Uh, out comes your final output. So you might be actually refined to be, you might actually refine your decision to a better one based on other people's inputs. So this is like something like what is done over here. Okay, so let's move on. So next problem that we need to solve is how do we leverage this data in a very robust way, in a way that basically doesn't really cause us to like over focus on our on one neighbor or over focus on our original observation. So one way that uh, the, they did it in this paper is they take the observation and all these are all the retrieved data from your neighbors, right? What they did was basically they pass all this through like some neural network, F, okay? F beta actually, yeah, pass this through a neural network. And then the outcome of the neural network will be like OTE, which is the embedding space of the neural network. So if I were to draw the diagram, it's like, it'll be like that, the observation space, which is like maybe your bot position goes through a neural network F and then out comes the output space will be like the embedding after, after passing through this, this model F. Or I mean, it also could be like one of the like final layers of this, um, this model F, like one of the previous layers, which will give us this, this uh, hidden state, okay? So for all the neighbors, what we do is we also do the same procedure and get the embedding space. But for the neighbors, okay, there's something critical that they did here. They actually average out the neighbors here. So they took a sum of all the neighbors' embeddings and they divided by square root n. Okay, so this is quite curious. Okay, why square root n? Yeah, because it's like kind of weird, right? Yeah, so in the original uh, Transformers architecture, when you do the q, q dot k, after that, what you do is actually you divide by square root n. Square root d, which is like the dimension of your like dimension of your hidden layers. So they say that that regularizes the network well. So why did they do square root n? Yeah, so this is something that I'll, I still don't have an answer to because I would say, I would think that if you do by divide by n, it will be better because you are averaging out all the observations. But if you do by square root n, I don't know, maybe this is a way to regularize it. But I would think that in order to have the same magnitude as your observation space, your embedding space should divide by n. So I'm not too sure why, uh, why they did that. Okay, because like they did not explain this at all in the paper. Yeah, maybe some graph neural networks folks would understand this, but I don't think this is correct. I think you should actually divide by n. 
Okay, because you want to make both the observation space and your concatenated embedding space in the same kind of uh, magnitude. Alternatively, what they could have also done is they could have done this. They could have done the observation space embedding, and then they concatenate with all the neighbors' embeddings one by one, like E E one T, E two T, and so on. Yeah. So you can also concatenate all of them together, but the problem is your vector might be very long. Okay, so I think over here the averaging method might be better because like it makes the vector smaller, but you might lose some data. Okay. Alternatively, what we can also do is we can do like we could also do majority voting. Yeah. So these are ways that we can like leverage all these multiple sources of inputs together. Okay, so this is the way that they use memory for this uh, structure. All right, so before we go on to like the main architecture itself, let me just recap a bit on like my views on memory that I shared before uh, in the memory as learning kind of presentation the last time. So I feel like for memory, okay, we actually store the memory like in abstract form. So in this case, like the memory over here is like the maybe the bot observation itself. And then like the values will probably be like the next action and also like the sequence of moves. Okay, so this abstraction over here, okay, that what I was thinking of this abstraction, oh, it's actually like in the paper, they actually did this G5, which is basically the, you go through the first kind of, like you basically learn a kind of embedding and then you apply this embedding plus some PCA and then you can store your memories in this space, that the abstraction space. So I feel like this kind of way, like to do a fixed storage of memory into this abstraction space, because if you look at the paper, this G5 is actually unchanging, it's fixed. It's, it's learned at the start and then you use it throughout the entire process. So I think this is very important because if you don't fix this representation, your memories input space, okay, to this abstraction space, this process, if you change it halfway, then all your previous stock memories okay, might all be affected because like the abstraction space actually is very, very important as to how you store your memories. So this part being fixed is I think quite, quite crucial for the method to work. Uh, the authors did mention that they are going to try to make this uh, learn, learn embedding be trained end to end. Yeah, I think that might cause like destabilization issues. I don't think that's, uh, that's actually a good idea but we will see uh, how it goes when the authors come out with their next paper. All right, then after you train to a fixed embedding space, it's up to you to how, as, as to how you want to use this abstraction space, okay, in order to learn something. So this is the key idea behind it. Yeah, so the, this, this, this slide is basically after you form into this abstraction space, which is like maybe it's already fixed, okay, you basically, don't have to update all the previous memories the moment the abstraction map mapping changes. Yeah. So yeah, this one is something that I'm still thinking about, but uh, I think this paper sort of like verifies like this idea that your abstraction space here should be fixed okay, in order for it to work. All right. Okay, so now we go through the overall model. So this is the model itself. All right, the model is actually a more scaled up version of whatever I talked about earlier. So initially you have a game state. Okay, maybe like the black number of black stones, the number of white stones, their positions, who's next to move, what's the last spot position. These are the game state, similar to what has been used in Alpha Zero. Okay, we go through the pre-trained embedding network, the embedding space. And for this game itself, we also go through the embedding space. And then we compare this Okay, using this scan method. Okay, so that's not, I think I forgot to talk about the scan method, but the scan method, this is uh, what I think is, is, is being done. It's like that. You actually have your query vector. Okay, and then you have your key vector here. And then you have all of them in some space. So what you do is like you take the query vector and then you perform some operations on all of the key vectors. So you, you take this and then you perform an operation on all the key vectors using the same query. And then what you will get is you will get some form of Euclidean distance. So this is like, if you can do this method like in parallel, you can actually get your Euclidean distance. We call it ED, Euclidean distance here. 
And then you can actually do some form of sorting. After you get the Euclidean distance, you sort them. And then you take the first n. Yeah, so there's probably going to be some time incurred for the sorting. Yeah, so this might be the, but you can actually do stuff like Q sort or this, which actually runs in n log n time, which may be still scalable, even for like billion neighbors. Yeah, but it will definitely be slower than the neural network retrieval itself. Okay, because this requires some time to sort the top few neighbors. Okay, so this is the scan architecture. All right, after that, we take the top n neighbors over here and then feed their metadata inside here. And then remember just now we talked about the summation of e, EIT over square root n, right? So this is the, the part that's done here. You actually take the observation here and then you sum it over like n, n I guess is the number of neighbors, yeah, square root n. So this is the part that's being done over here. But over here, you can get the observation space here. Observation ET. OET. Yeah. Observation for that particular time step. Yeah. So we can get the observation itself from the model plus the nearest neighbors retrieve and then pass through the same model. We can then concatenate them together here. We concatenate these two together. And then we can use it to get the value and the policy network. Yeah, so that's more or less the uh what is being done for the overall model. Okay, maybe I just pause here for uh, any quick questions if you want to ask for this network. Okay, so all, all good here. Just one point of note is that when they back propagate here, this part here is not back propagate. This part here has no gradients. Oh, sorry, yeah. This part over here has no gradients. So let me just draw it here. Mm. This part here, this part here is all algorithm. Uh, this this is all algorithmic. Okay, no gradients. Okay, and this actually sort of like is similar to the kind of idea that I was thinking of. So like that, you firstly can do some form of processing that is like heuristic based, like algorithm algorithm based. Then after that, you go through the neural networks. Okay, it's basically uh, yeah, it's basically it's basically this part here. You actually have a fixed way to do like to go into the abstraction space in order to do the processing. All right. So I think this is more or less the, the way ahead. I see a lot of papers in the RIPs or so that do some form of fixed embedding space before they use it to process the data. So this actually learns much faster than an end-to-end -end system. And over here, this is also the fixed part of the system. And then the, the dynamic part that is changeable is the part that is at the top over here. So I think this architecture is quite quite nice, yeah, the way that this is done. Okay, let's move to the next slide. So this is the equation to process the output. So Y is the output, next action or next value. O is the current observation. Okay, M is basically the entire model that you saw just now. The model, if you look at the previous slide, the M is actually this, M is actually this whole model here that takes in the, the neighbor's inputs and the current bot state input and outputs the value and the policy network. Okay, so there's also like this is the neighbors. Sorry, these are the neighbors. The, the metadata of the neighbors. Okay, so this is the interesting part. Okay, now let's look at the results. Okay, this all be, we've been talking about just the model itself. How exactly does the model perform? Okay, on the goal game itself. So that's interesting. Okay, one key thing that uh, you need to take note of is that they actually use expert self-play games. So the training for this model is a little unfair, I would say, because you already have access to the best possible data. Okay, using the alpha zero style agent, or rather they use the mu zero agent to get already the best games that are already played. So this basically means that all your data is more or less the correct label already. Yeah, so this is uh, something that is one of the key limitations of this work, I feel. If you all remember the word Gato, have you heard of the Gato word before? Gato by DeepMind? Uh, Evan, so you all heard of Gato before? Imagine it. Yeah, so Gato, right, they also use expert trajectories to train the transformer. So while it's impressive, you can still re repeat whatever the transformer gives you. 
it kind of means that if you don't have the expert trajectory, okay, if you don't have this expert trajectory, your method doesn't work anymore, right? So uh, this is something that I think is one of the limitations of this work. So it should work without the expert trajectory in order for it to be like really a self-learning agent. Okay, so this is one of the limitations I feel. Okay, but let's let's suppose we give it the expert trajectories. Okay, we randomly subsample some of the positions. Okay, to retrieve. Okay, so this basically means that not all the positions in the in the trade agents game are used for this network. So for the retrieval data set, okay, you only use fifteen percent of it, and you use this to basically train. So the entire positions of this like fifteen percent of the positions are used to learn this mapping G. Okay, the mapping G is learned using like one of the layers, one of the hidden layers after being trained on this data set. And plus some more, you need to use the PCA projection, right? Then uh, when we do the testing, okay, we actually split the retrieval data set into two parts. Okay, so there's one data set here, data set R. Maybe we call it data set R1 and data set R2. So if we have an observation that we want to query, Okay, and the observation that we want to query is currently in the data set R1. Okay, if the observation is in here, what we'll do is we basically cannot query this data set. Okay, because this data set will already contain like you know the answers, right? To this uh to, to what to do next, because these are expert gameplays. So what we'll do is we'll query instead the data set R2. So at any point of time, you only query half of the data is to prevent some form of uh, test data leakage. Because if you query the, the correct neighbor itself that is already present in this data set, you will get the model answer. And with that model answer, you can like get full marks already. So we want to prevent that from happening. So we use this method of splitting. Okay, so this is the results. Okay, quite interesting. Let's take a look from the left side. So this left side results, you can see that as your neighbors increase, okay, as the number of, so the baseline is basically you don't do any retrieval at all. You basically just use the single agent without retrieval. You can see that the accuracy of like the network predictions actually go, or uh, accuracy of the next move prediction actually increase with neighbors. Okay, but the increase is not too significant for two neighbors and 10 neighbors. Okay, why that's the case we can discuss later. All right. So if you look at like maybe the number of neighbors, you can see that the top, Accuracy also increases as you increase your number of neighbors. Okay, the value MSE is basically this top one accuracy is the policy network, is the pi network, which uh, predicts the like the next action. This value is for the direct value network, uh, which is like the how desirable the game state is. So you can see that the mean square error actually is, is, is decreasing. So this is good. As the number of neighbors increase, you can see that the same trend happens. The value MSE decreases, which is better, and the accuracy prediction is higher. All right, so we talk about model size. If we increase the number of parameters in the model, you can see there's an increasing trend as well. Okay, over here, this one is a bit inconclusive. Inconclusive. So it goes to show that like the increasing model size may or may not really help with the value prediction. Probably because value prediction, if you increase the model size, you have a lot more to learn in order to map the correct function. Maybe that's why it, it kind of affects it. Okay, so it doesn't help that much here. Okay, for the last part, when we increase the retrieval data size, set size, which is the initial data set we used to retrieve from, you can see that actually there's an increase in the accuracy and also decrease in the value. So this shows that with a larger data set, there's a higher chance of you getting the right trajectory and then you can get like a good answer. So this goes to show that actually using memory to augment your agent's observations actually can help with improving performance even for like a uh, complicated game such as Go. So it's quite, uh, I, I find that this is quite conclusive to tell us that uh, just a neural network alone may not learn every single thing because if your neural network alone learns every single thing already, using the retrieval data set should not benefit the network much because you are using the same data to actually train your neural network, uh, to train this, let me show you. You are using the same, oops, you are using the same data to actually train this neural network, like this pink color thing here is actually the same data as whatever that's inside here. Because, so if let's say we don't have to use the retrieval at all, 
you would expect to see similar performance in this network alone, okay? But the fact that we still need to use this retrieval in order to improve the performance shows that this neural network weights, remember I said earlier, the neural network weights are slow to train, right? Perhaps if you train this more, you don't need the, the memory at the, at the site here. Yeah. Not only are they slow to train, actually neural network, weight, neural network weights can, can actually bias earlier data. Yeah, which which also means that you may not get a convergence in your training. Yeah. So if we actually use like an external data set here, you might actually mitigate these two problems. You have fast training. If you could change your data set, you can have fast training. And you also can have like more reliable ways of getting your data. So this is like some of the key things that I like to emphasize. Uh, question? Yes. Can you go back to the plot? So for the relative model size, right? Why this there is no like you said there's no improvement um value mean square error, but there is seemingly some improvement on the top one increase. Are you talking about this relative model size, right? Yes. Okay, so again, whatever I say here is just my view because it's not discussed in the paper. Okay, but for this value, right? Value predictions are actually harder to do for a neural network because it's like a regression problem. So for a regression problem, what I feel is like this. You know linear regression, right? Yeah, linear regression is like best fit line between like a straight line for the points, right? So for linear regression, you know, if you do a point like that, okay, this is like for parameter size, like, I, uh, sorry, is that is there some noise there? So if let's say I only like do something like y equals to mx plus c, which is basically using a linear model, you might actually fit it better in terms of predicting the trend because it's somewhat like a regression problem. But if I increase my model size, then it becomes more of like polynomial regression. You might actually have like a trend like that. And so while this may actually like fit the data well, it actually is not as robust in terms of like the, it's not as robust in the, like within the interpolation side, it doesn't interpolate well, neither does it extrapolate well. So it might actually overfit the model if you have a larger model size for value. Of course, why this, why this improvement on the top one accuracy? Oh, because top one accuracy is do, do, using a softmax loss. So, when you do an increasing model size, you actually help to make the model more expressive. So you can potentially like contain like more complicated expressions. And because of the way we do softmax, it doesn't really matter if you have a very, very large model at the bottom. You know, your, your softmax can actually solve self-regularize. Okay? So in general, having a larger model can learn more relations and potentially help to improve performance. Yeah, but you can see the performance improvement also not much. Uh. It's actually, it means that the model size is not really the key, the key issue here. Yeah. So um, a classification problem can benefit from increasing model size more than a regression problem. Okay, that's, uh, that's my intuition of neural networks. Yeah, I'm not sure if you buy that. Yeah, but, but softmax can actually regu regulate the amount of gradient updates because of the nature of softmax. You sum up all only to one. So there's a, like a maximum uh, maximum gradient that is propagated through a softmax. Yeah. When you do accuracy problems, you're actually doing, your last layer is actually a softmax. Uh, so you are saying there's no, cor there no correlation between the value and the value mean square loss and the performance? Uh, there is actually a correlation because with the value, you actually use this to do, later on, they use the, this to train a policy which uses Monte Carlo tree search. At the Monte Carlo tree search, the value will actually bias the kind of nodes that they search. So there's some use for the value. But um, the thing is, it didn't really affect the model that much, right? I, I would say, yeah. Because like, it's only, the, the mean square error is like, the variation is quite little. So uh, although increasing model size like hurts performance a little when we increase more, but the, the gains that you get in the like this accuracy may already outweigh this. 
Yeah, because you actually have a higher win rate. Later, you see the later graphs, you actually have a higher win rate with larger model size. Okay, uh, I have another question, but I'm not sure whether it's the good point to ask. Because uh, maybe you, you ask that... first, then I can okay. tell you whether I'm covering it. Okay, okay, you, because you mentioned that you're comparing the the memory with when you have a larger data set, right? Uh, oh. Yes, yes, you mean this one over here, right? Yeah. So my question is, I, I okay, so I still don't understand. I, I feel like... uh. So you retrieve the nearest end neighbor. I feel it's like just a heuristics to tell you which which part of your past experiences can help you to improve more. So you focus on those experiences. So how is it different from say the uh her, which is the, the hindsight experience replay? They also try to, to figure out what are the which part of the past experiences are, are more helpful. So I think they only differ by the heuristic that's true, sir. Yeah, actually hindsight experience replay doesn't have an external memory. I mean, they have a replay buffer, yes, but um, when it comes to inference, they only infer with the agent itself. So it's something like a replay buffer. Uh, it's not exactly the same as this part here because when you talk about end neighbors here, we're actually talking about inference time. You actually use the data from these neighbors to do your processing. So, 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 so this memory doesn't contribute to optimize your agent. It's only at the inference times you use it. Yes, actually you also use to optimize your agent because later the loss function that you, you do when you retrieve this will be back propagated to the whole model, including the agents part as well. Uh, so so in a sense, it's, it's quite similar, right? Uh, it, uh, exclu excluding the inference Excluding part. the nearest neighbor part is similar. But uh, sorry, hindsight experience replay is something different also because they do have a goal that they want to get in, into. But over here, we don't really have a goal. Yeah, we are just training the value and the accuracy itself. Yeah, hindsight experience replay is like, oh, I want to go from point A to point B. But when I go from point A to point B, I actually pass by point C. So I can also train my policy to go to point C as well using the same moves to go to point B. Yeah, so it's, the concept is slightly different. I feel like goal directed mechanisms are much more efficient and I advocate for it in my model as well. It's just not done in this model. Yeah, so I think over here you're saying that why will retrieval data set size increase affect the performance, right? When what matters more is this retrieval, right? Okay, so let me explain why this affects. Because with increasing data set size, you have more chance of finding better neighbors. So when you have better neighbors, you get better performance as well. So that's the reason why. Yeah, uh, is, is that clear? Uh, okay. Yeah. okay, let's move on. Okay, because there's other results here. So um, they also did win rate against some AI agent called Pachi. And with the number of neighbors that you reference, the more number of neighbors, actually your win rate increases. Okay, but only for a certain extent. After that, here you can see that it actually drops down. So it probably means that like as you increase more neighbors to reference, the amount of contribution of your neighbors would actually like diminish. Yeah, maybe it's because they did a divide by square root n. Remember earlier they did the embedding space divide by square root n? I'm asking like why, all right? <laughs> so <laughs> I need to ask the creators, why did they do square root n? Because it doesn't look like it should be done with a square root term. It looks like you should divide by n instead, right? In order to get the magnitudes to be the same for the observation and the and the augmented memory. Okay, but I may be wrong, okay? But I feel like this is a mistake, okay? So the other thing is that with your model size increase, you can see as what I said earlier, although your value didn't really improve, but you see based on just the, like, the policy network alone, you actually get a better win rate already. But you can see that the win rate didn't really increase that much after like model size two, which means uh, diminish, diminishing returns. And this also highlights that, you know, people keep saying scale is everything. GPT-4 will be the best, you know, that kind of thing. Wait till you see diminishing returns. Okay, I think it's coming soon. Then people will need to start working on other methods to improve performance already. Okay, so this is a case of diminishing returns, um, but it does show that increasing your model size actually helps with the prediction accuracy and your win rate as well. All right, so this is something that is more relevant to my work, actually. 
So they actually try to augment the data set with the performance of like the alpha zero versus Pachi. Okay, previously the original data set was alpha zero versus alpha zero or mu zero versus mu zero. Okay, I mean, they didn't say which data set they use, but I'm just thinking that alpha zero and mu zero will be about the same. So initially it was alpha zero versus alpha zero. The data that was used was used to train the, or was used in the retrieval data set. But now instead of alpha zero versus alpha zero only, we also do Pachi data set also. So we have this thing called train plus Pachi. This is the retrieval data set. So you can see that um, over here, um, okay, let's just take a look at this, this thing here, all right? So the baseline without retrieval is like all the way at the bottom, which is not too bad already, actually. The retrieval, without retrieval, the win rate is not bad because, I mean, of, of course, it's been trained with expert trajectories, right? So it's actually quite a good baseline already. But if we just take from the training data set alone, you can see that the, the win rate is like quite high, but you can actually improve it if you take the retrieval from the training data set plus the Apache data set also. So this will give you the highest. So it means that the data set, the retrieval data set affects your performance. How well this retrieval buffer is, or this retrieval uh, data set is, will be a huge factor in determining the performance of this retrieval model. So it is very important to give the right data set to the agent. Okay, so I feel like this is sort of a validation of the kind of method that I'm doing for my upcoming paper, where basically I try to vary the stuff that is stored in memory according to the agent's present information of the environment. And this is very similar to them augmenting it with Apache data set. Okay, that basically is more similar to how the agent fares because they are actually pitting it against Apache. Apache is their opponent. So by giving it the right data set against your opponent, you actually can improve your retrieval performance. All right, so this is quite interesting. So next, aha, this is the one that I would like to talk about. You know, Monte Carlo Tree Search, very, very powerful algorithm used in AlphaGo, used in AlphaZero. Okay, it turns out that even without using Monte Carlo Tree Search, just by increasing the number of, oops, just by increasing the number of neighbors, you can actually get superior performance already. And in fact, much superior performance with the same compute cost as your Monte Carlo Tree Search. Okay, this is actually quite, uh, to me, I think it's quite, quite intuitive. Why? All right, because Monte Carlo Tree Search requires you to search the entire tree, right? And then each time you search the tree, you actually bootstrap your error from your value network and policy network, which may mean that your Monte Carlo tree search simulation may not be as, as well informative as you taking another neighbor. So like a Monte Carlo tree search, you might search different parts of the tree, but you know, you might search the wrong part of the tree. It's, it can be quite a complicated game tree. But if you could just search more neighbors like over here, you would be able to directly get the experience from that neighboring node itself. You know, that is already like more or less a, a completed search of the Monte Carlo tree search tree. Okay, this is like incomplete. Okay, this Monte Carlo tree search tree is subject to bootstrapping errors. Yeah, it may not be the most efficient way to do it. Okay, but if you just take the neighbors itself, it might be an even more efficient way to actually get your data. And that's why I think this is better. Okay, and this is probably the way ahead that DeepMind might want to focus on, to use retrieval augmented approaches in order to improve performance on their models. Okay, so this is one of the, I think, key insights. It's weird why they put it in the appendix, but I think this is actually quite a key insight that I got from this paper as well. Question? Uh, oh yeah, sure. So in Go, how, in Go, right, how do, how do you make sure if you want to use nearest neighbor, how do you make sure your data size, data set size is large enough if you don't use Monte Carlo tree search? Uh, in order to make your data set large enough, you kind of need to do self-play, especially in the optimization-based game like Go. Yeah, so um, there is no escaping it because you need a large enough retrieval data set in order to get relevant positions. Go especially is very harsh because one move difference can mean win or lose. Yeah, so I would say that there needs to be an external way to generate this retrieval data set, uh, especially for this kind of methods. 
if you want to use then it. The, the, doesn't that mean Monte Carlo Tree Search still has its own niche? Yeah, you can use Monte Carlo Tree Search for the initial data generation. In fact, uh, the way they played this policy out, they also use Monte Carlo Tree Search to actually sample the next move for even for this retrieval neighbor spike. But in terms of like using Monte Carlo Tree Search to like search through potential outcomes, is inferior to like using the neighbors. But of course, what you say is correct. Your retrieval data set needs to be large enough, it needs to be relevant enough. Yeah. Wait, so, sorry, so you said the in terms of searching the potential, what? The, your retrieval uh, data set needs to be large enough so that. No, no, can, no, no, no. You are, you are saying Monte Carlo's research is inferior to the nearest neighbor way. Right? Yes, correct. When it comes to. Sorry, can because I repeat that part again? Monte Carlo tree search takes time to like search through the tree. Whereas if you have a neighbor that is very close already, it's like almost instant you can get the experience of that neighbor. So but, but the time, but the but the time is already trade off in terms of when you generate the data, right? I'm sorry, when you generate your experiences or your uh, relevant yes, experiences. You are right. Over here, we did not compare the time taken to generate your retrieval data set. But it is uh, assumed that the time is negligible because you might have gotten it from maybe earlier experiences. Uh, that, that's why, like in Go, you you have so many different states. Like in order to just generate that retrieval data set, it's it's very costly. I think it's not trivial. Uh, yes, correct. So in this case, that's why I say this is a key limitation of this work, is that they use uh they not only use the uh expert trajectories. They also use the expert trajectories data set. So if imagine if you were to start from scratch with a lousy network or with a beginner network, you will have problems to even come out with that retrieval data set in the first place. So that's one of the key limitations of this work. Okay, I agree. So if you already have expert trajectory, right? Then it's not you can assume safely assume that the rest part you didn't search through it's not very really important because the, all the bad the good moves are already inside your expert trajectory then you just compare the you are right this part. Actually, yeah. actually that's very insightful so that indeed is why Monte Carlo's research is still needed in order to like generate the data set yeah uh, and I feel like um the way this works without Monte Carlo's research you are right in the sense that the Monte Carlo's research has already been implied over here already through like previous experiences they also use Monte Carlo tree search to compute and then like store the value in the neighbors. Yeah, which I mean might be a limiting factor for applying this to learn models from scratch. Uh, last question on this part is uh, so so does it does this matter like hinder you from like, is it the best best thing you can do is just on par with the expert or can you surpass oh, they the actually uh they actually surpass the expert in some sense because if you treat the baseline model as the expert they actually perform better with the same amount of training. Like you see this baseline, this is like the expert baseline because um, it's been trained on the same data set as the retrieval. So in some sense, because the neural network takes some time to learn. Okay, so actually it's not really surpassed the expert because we didn't really pit this model against the alpha zero itself, is it? Alpha zero, I think will be tops. I, I think they didn't pit against alpha zero because alpha zero still is the champion. Because you look at the way that they, did this model they only took 15 percent of positions from sample game alpha zero is the teacher okay and this memory retrieval network is the student okay in order for the student to surpass the teacher it needs to have its own self-improving mechanism which it doesn't have so i'm quite sure it doesn't surpass alpha zero but it definitely surpass basically given these positions here it surpass a neural network train on these positions so it probably suffered the same limitation as imitation learning. Yes, yes, you're right. That's very insightful, actually. Yeah, it, it goes to show that the results over here is just an improvement of the retrieval data set over a neural network baseline to learn the same data set. It's not an improvement to basically surpass the master, to surpass the teacher. It, it doesn't do that. All right, I see. thanks. Yeah, so, so I'm not too happy with like some aspects of this work. But I chose this work to talk about because I quite like the idea that you can use past experiences or you can use your neighbors to improve your prediction or improve the next thing that you want to process on. This idea, I think, is important. Okay, I, I do not agree fully with the entire architecture, per se, because especially this expert game thing, like I don't agree with Gato as well, because if you use expert games, 
you know, then, then how can you learn the expert trajectory? So I had, before you get, I mean, if everyone has the expert trajectory, sure. But how can you learn the expert trajectory? I think that's the main thing that we want to do in reinforcement learning. Okay, so uh, this doesn't solve that part. Okay, so uh, we talk about the next part that they did. This is called neighbor regularization. And this neighbor regularization is something that they do in order to basically prevent the neighbors from being too sucked up in some like wrong neighbor. So they want to like make sure that sometimes you can like remove some bad influence. Okay, but overall my verdict is that actually these are all very badly designed. Okay, so you look at neighbor dropout, you drop out a random subset of retrieved neighbors. So it's like dropout like that. And basically dropout may not be able to get the right neighbors to be dropped out. Yeah, so this is sort of like some stochastic noise, I would say. Yeah, neighbor randomization. They re replace the entire neighbors with another neighbor with a different observation. It's, it's like, this is actually giving it bad data, isn't it? <laughs> All right, neighbor regularization. Okay, is to make the embedding similar to the original. Okay, what, what this hints to me is that means neighbor embedding is bad. <laughs> Because if you need to use something to, to draw you closer to the, the original one, it's like, it's like the reinforcement learning from human feedback. Your final PPO model, you have a regularization term to draw it to the, to the SFT model. The, the super, I can't remember what that's the F means, supervised, uh, the supervised fine tuning model. You need another loss to draw it to the original model, which means that maybe the, that step of, of PPO is actually not that great. Yeah, I mean, if you need to use a regularization like this to bring your neighbor embedding closer to the original, I don't think it means that the neighbors are actually quite well, well, well placed, right? Because if not, you wouldn't need this. All right, so let's see what happens when we do this neighbor regularization. You can see that over here, this is the win rate, and these are the different base. Like baseline is basically the uh baseline of the model without the, the memory augmentation. Retrieval is the model that has the neighbor augmentation. And then this contains all the dropouts. So neighbor dropout, neighbor randomization, neighbor regularization, all these three are in the retrieval model. So then we do the retrieval model without either of this, and then we see how the win rate is. So you can see the baseline, the win rate is not bad. With the retrieval, the win rate improves, okay? Okay, and then if we remove away like neighbor randomization, okay? If we take away the neighbor randomization, the win rate actually drops. Okay, so it seems to be that the neighbor randomization is better for performance. But you saw the description of neighbor randomization. It is to replace the neighbors with some other observations neighbors. Okay, so I'm not too sure why this helps actually because then it shows that maybe the neighbors are not very informative after all, right? I swap away the neighbors with a random neighbor and you perform better. Right or not? Yeah, so I, I'm not sure why this, this is the case. It, this seems like quite counterintuitive and that's probably why it's in the appendix of the paper rather than the main paper. All right, then we also have this thing called the neighbor dropout. Okay, neighbor dropout is something like uh, dropout and without neighbor dropout actually performs better. Okay, so what this hints to me is that this neighbor dropout is not good, which I, I, I agree. I also think this neighbor randomization is not good. Okay, I'm not too sure why this affects, makes the performance so much better. Okay, because without neighbor randomization, it, become, it becomes like this. Okay, next we have neighbor regularization, which basically makes it closer to the original embedding space itself. And you can see that over here, with no neighbor regularization, it actually performs better. So I think this should not be done as well. Yeah. So the only thing that's worth doing based on this result is the neighbor randomization, which is weird. Okay, because it just means that maybe the way that they extract the neighbors is a little too. Um, uh, how, I, how would I put it? Maybe the original embedding space of the neighbors is not informative enough that you, you just randomly swap out. You might actually, by some chance, make it perform better. Yeah. I think I can, can just do ablation study on how, how many percent you want to randomize, right? Then until totally random. <laughs> yeah, correct. So this one, I think, needs more analysis as to why this is useful. But they did say that they did all these three because in, in initial studies, it seems to improve performance. But once they try it on the final model, it it somehow seems to hurt performance. So, but I, I don't think they have the time to redo the experiments again. That's why this is in the appendix. 
Yeah, but this is something that is interesting because actually I don't agree with any single method of neighbor regularization. The only method I can think and I can agree on is probably like maybe neighbor dropout because like sometimes you want to, but the neighbor dropout is not in the way that they did it. The neighbor dropout I was thinking is your observation space. You maybe like take away one or two stones and then you try to find like matching neighbors with a different observation space. And then, yeah, maybe you can do some like sort of uh, weighted embedding space. So the dropout will be the dropout of the observation rather than the neighbors. Yeah, but based on this tree description of this tree regularization, I don't agree with any of them. Yeah. <laughs> so it's curious as to why this neighbor randomization actually make the result better. Uh, design. Yeah. So maybe that's for future analysis. Yeah. Unfortunately for this paper, they did not really go in depth with uh, the analysis of their results. Okay, maybe due to space constraints or otherwise, but I feel like this thing should be highlighted somewhere in the main paper, if, but it was in the appendix, all right? Okay, we have reached more or less the end of the presentation. So now let's uh, talk more about like some questions that I want to discuss about, all right? So first question is, rather than just like averaging out the embedding spaces in the nearest neighbors, why not use like a weighted sum according to Euclidean distance? Oops, sorry. Yeah, so the weighted sum would mean that like if your Euclidean distance is higher or if your Euclidean distance is lower, all right, then you pay attention more to the embedding space. So you don't give every single embedding space an equal weightage. You pay attention more to those that are more similar to your original space. You could even just use the original attention mechanism, the Q dot K. You can just use that Q dot K, the dot product, and just use it to do the attention mechanism, right? You can do Q dot K divided by square root D times the value, you know? Yeah. So this is the attention mechanism, and then you softmax this. Yeah, the original attention mechanism, I'm very familiar with it right now because I've been seeing this very, very often nowadays, <laughs> especially with ChatGPT. So this is a softmax. I think you could just use the attention mechanism and get your value here. Okay, so it just puzzles me why they didn't do that and instead use a Euclidean distance, squared Euclidean distance. Yeah. So you have so, any comments on this? Yeah. 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 So isn't is it isn't that the same thing as when you're n equals to one, right? As what? Sorry. N equals to one. Sorry. What do you mean? N equals to one. The nearest neighbor. Okay, uh, nearest neighbor n equals to one. No, it's not the same. So for example, let me just draw it out. Okay, you have like a neighbor here. You have this observation space. And then you have a few neighbors here. Okay, let's say that um, in terms of similarity, it's like 70% similar to, to this neighbor. And then like 10% similar to the second neighbor and 20% similar to the last neighbor. So what we want to do is we want to then see uh, like how much of this each neighbor's value that we want to get, right? Oh, right. Just... I, think, I, I think I get it, I get it, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's not n equals but... to one. You actually do a weighted sum of your neighbor's embeddings rather than just simply taking like the average as what is done in the paper. But the extreme case will be n equals to one, right? Where you put the, the most uh, hundred percent on, on nearest. Like, you put 100% yeah. on one neighbor, then that will be n yeah. equals to one. So, so my thought on this is back to the, the plot you showed it uh, just now, right? The a equals to 10 doesn't really improve much on a equals to 2. Whereas you can think of it as the, 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 the slightly worse 8 out of 10, right? Doesn't, doesn't really help that much. Yeah. I mean, so it shows that the weighted, uh, the averaging out doesn't really work too well, right? Because the more you the more you average out, the the more similar your embedding space become, right? So this this probably means that the way that they did the embedding uh averaging probably needs to be improved. Okay, at least from this diagram here. Yeah. Okay, okay. I, I move to the next question. Yeah, so I, I take it as like you also agree with me that we should use some form of like weighted, af weighted average of the embedding space. Okay, this might actually make it perform better actually. Yeah, so actually the other thing that I was thinking of is 
do we need to actually know like the future game trajectories or just we just need to know the next action and value right why do we need to know like all the future next states because you know if you have all the future trajectories then how do we average out <laughs> in the in, in the embedding space yeah so this is something that i i this is a question that i honestly have i didn't see the answer in the paper you see each neighbor has the, has their own trajectory and then the paper says that we average out the embedding space for each neighbor. How do we average out um, next trajectory embeddings, right? So that to me feels more like a memory kind of thing rather than like embedding space kind of thing. Yeah, you kind of need to store the trajectories in, in a variable and then you need to pass on that variable. Yeah, so my feel is that like you don't really need to know the future game trajectories to predict. You just need to know the next action. I mean, after all, all your neighbors are all expert gameplay, right? You just need to know what's your next action and you train your policy network to predict it well. That's good enough. In fact, you don't even need the value, right? Can we do away with the value? If you are using expert trajectories, you just need to store the action and then you will do very well already because by training your network to do the same action as your expert, that may be good enough already. Okay, so yeah, do we even need to use like a Monte Carlo tree search to sample the policy so that you can play this game with like Pachi? I'm not too sure, you know, whether you still need Monte Carlo tree search. What I was thinking is you can actually simplify the network architecture. You give it the bot state. Okay, you, you pass it through a neural network. And then out comes your action as in the action of what you do. Because you already know this action is the optimal action because it's an expert trajectory. Okay, even if you have like nearest neighbors here, let's call the nearest neighbors uh, E, you can also then pass it through like maybe a neural network. Okay, maybe the neural network part comes later. So maybe you pass it through, hang on. Uh, yeah, basically after this, you will then combine them together and then it will go through another neural network here. Yeah. yeah, so over here, I might put neural network, but actually this part here is, this is the fixed part. Uh, this is actually the fixed embedding space that we go through. So even if we use like nearest neighbors, okay, we can also just predict the action. Yeah, this is uh, what I think could be done. Again, obviously they didn't do this because this is alpha zero architecture with uh, policy, is the policy and the value network. So I'm curious to see whether just the action alone is it good enough. All right. So yeah, do you have any comments on this? No comment. Okay, then let's talk about the last one, which is the most critical part of this architecture. Same for Gato. Like if we if we don't have expert trajectories, can we even learn the optimal path? Right? Because you kind of need to improve yourself through self-play and so on with alpha zero. But if we just use like nearest neighbors to get the answer, you may not actually get the best value, you may not get the best policy because the nearest neighbors may be also inaccurate. Because if your neighbor's neighbors are not the expert iterations, you cannot really trust your neighbors fully. So how can we learn without these expert trajectories? Maybe one way to do it is to, this is my, my own thoughts, okay? Is to label like the ELO rating of the neighbors, okay? And then weigh those with higher ELO more. Yeah, so in some sense, you can like bias your trajectories to, uh, to basically, you can bias your neighbors to choose neighbors that are like better performing agents. It's like something like if I know that you are a chess master, I tend to follow your moves more than someone who just started chess. Uh, so you can also adjust the retrieval data set with best ELO agents. Yeah. So in some sense, we can use the best ELO and then we can adjust the data set. And then we can also like use Monte Carlo tree search to improve ELO with self-play. So, so there's a there's a few mechanisms you can do. One is we can like use the memory retrieval method to like learn better neighbors and hence improve the the network of the of the overall like memory retrieval network. And the other way is you can really train using alpha zero method from the start and then use it to then train the retrieval network. Yeah, but I think using uh, the alpha zero at the start to train retrieval network will lead to inferior performance. 
So I believe this Monte Carlo tree search for self play maybe it can be done like like as a as a loop like you can self play with with whatever you have and then you get more data and then put in your refer retriever network learn more and then go through self play and so on so so it might be a cycle yeah but I feel like it might be more burdensome they're just using a neural network and train with self play just like alpha zero this might actually give it more complexity. Yeah, so I'm not too sure whether this is a, a viable method, but this is definitely something that I think could potentially work. Yeah, if we don't have expert trajectories. Yeah. Sorry, but I thought we already established that uh, the agent cannot outperform the so called expert. So if you use the agent's all experiences as expert, you how can you improve? Oh, but if you let the agent self play with each other, you can train it in an alpha zero style method where you can use the self-play to train the student and the student will improve such that it will surpass the teacher. In, in this case, the student and teacher are the same network. It's just that the teacher is like the current version, like you call it version one of your network. Then you can train a version two to be, beat version one of your network. Then your teacher will then be version two. Then you can train a version three to beat your version two. And this network itself, rather than just using the original alpha zero architecture, we can use this memory retrieval architecture. But but then if you're doing self play, then you can technically generate for however many data you want, right? So what's the advantage here? Uh the advantage I guess is faster learning. You can right, probably okay. learn faster with a data set than you can uh, adjust your neural network weights. Yeah. But then the, the value of this method will come into question because right now our retrieval data sets are perfect examples. If we could retrieve imperfect examples as well that might like kind of taint your results i don't know how effective your your learning process would be so this is something that needs to be thought about uh, i myself not too keen to like use their kind of method to actually do self-play because i i've worked with alpha zero methods before and they take very long to train so uh, personally the method that i'm proposing uh, in my upcoming paper i actually do a I do away with the alpha zero style of learning. Yeah, it's it's quite different. Yeah. So I'll I'll share more about uh what I wrote for my paper in a separate uh session. Yeah. Actually I shared before is the is the le uh, reinforcement learning fast and slow and but with some results now. Yeah. Okay, actually this is more or less the end for questions to ponder. Uh yeah actually I, I attached like a slide of like the, the network that I actually wrote. So the idea is that you actually use a goal to kind of like direct your actions to make it more efficient. It's like hindsight experience replay like that. You can actually, based on the goal that you have, you can actually change your actions. So it's very fast and efficient to achieve your goal. All right. And this is like the fast network. The slow network will then be like a parallel uh, retrieval of like pathways to the goal. And if there's such a path, you override your, your desired action with, with the slow method. So the memory method just serves as a way to remember like good paths or feasible paths to your goal state. Yeah, so something like this, I think might actually learn much faster than whatever that is proposed in the paper of the large scale memory retrieval. Yeah, because you can actually probably learn this uh, without needing to like do much self-play. Yeah, you can actually use like, just using this goal itself, you can learn. Probably not goal, okay. It's, this method is not meant to, to play optimal games like goal. Uh, for stuff like navigation, yeah, where you know it's not so harsh if your neighbors are slightly bad. Uh, for the game of Go, I can understand why it's so difficult for them because if you just change one stone, right? If you just change, sorry, let me go back to that slide. If you just change one stone position, you might change the outcome totally. Like you see over here, your position is here versus your position here. You already win or lose the game just from there. So this problem is a much harder problem to, to learn. Okay, using like a self-play kind of method, then the problem that my kind of uh, algorithm or my kind of structure is used for. Yeah, so different models, different approaches for different problems. Huh? So this approach might still have some use. So just to set track a bit on your method, uh, have you compared your method with some model-based RL? Which one is faster? Oh, okay. So if you talk about model-based RL, because they use neural networks, the model-based RL will definitely be faster. Yeah. 
but then again, if you use some approximation techniques, like what you see in this paper, you can actually retrieve memories like quite fast. It's just that uh, for this one, I actually retrieve not just one memory, I actually retrieve a trajectory. Like from one memory, I jump to the next one, then I jump to the next one and so on until I reach like the goal state. So because I'm doing like a look ahead step here, it's something like a Monte Carlo tree search, it's actually slow. Yeah, so this part is the one that is actually the, the, the bottleneck. Yeah, but, but model-based RL, it, they don't exactly like do all the trajectories all the way to the end. Is your, is your method compatible with model-based? Can you introduce a model to this? Yeah, actually, this is the model. <laughs> this is actually the world model in my method. Yeah, I'm using memory as a proxy to world models. But uh, definitely, you can replace this part with world models. It's just that I feel like world models take very long to learn. So that's that's probably why um that's probably why the world models itself, once you learn it, is very powerful. But in order to learn the world model, it can take many, many episodes to learn, which is something that I want to avoid. That's why I changed to this memory method. I see. Yeah. But yeah, we can talk about this more next time. I'm just saying that. After I saw this paper in Neurips, I was quite happy because like I was really thinking of some memory-based methods already. Then when I saw that using this memory can actually like help with performance, I was pretty I was, I was pretty excited actually. It means that we don't really need to just conform or constrain ourselves to just using a neural network for the memory. We can actually leverage on external memory and that might actually even perform better. So with that in mind, you know, I was quite assured that you know some kind of external memory method might actually be useful. So this is one way of doing it. The paper that you have just seen here is one way of doing it. Uh, the way that I'm proposing, the fast and slow one, is another way of doing it. So both are used for different things. I think their method, if you give it expert trajectories, can pretty can work pretty well for optimization based games. Uh, my method can work well for stuff that is not as it's not it's not as penalizing as like if you make one wrong move you, you lose the game yeah it, it's more for stuff that like oh if you make one wrong move you can just undo that move and go back to to the previous state like that kind of stuff my method can work better yeah okay yeah if not actually yeah sorry it, maybe I have one one last question okay uh, So so I, I still want to clarify. So so the memory here, oh, sorry, the memory here, right? Is it is it just is it just an embedding of your input? Oh no, no, no. The embed okay, the memory that is used in this network here is actually this uh, okay, you are saying this embedding of the input here, right? Oh yeah. Is also compared to the embedding of the data set. And then based on similarity, in this case the squared Euclidean distance. The, the more similar it is, like the more chance of it being retrieved. So we choose the, the like maybe the 10 most similar or n most similar neighbors here. And so this is the memory. Okay, so the memory actually is this, this part here where you basically extract neighbors from memory. So you don't do the n nearest neighbor on the fly. You do it before the training? You do it on the fly. Okay, so if you do it on the fly then, I still feel it's very similar to a buffer, right? Uh, different because uh, in a buffer, you are actually using it to train the main network here. And then at, I thought inference, you... at inference time, right? You don't have any memory retrieval to augment your observation at all. This is the normal, typical process. But with the memory augmented process here, you have this pathway that I'm going to draw in purple. You have this pathway here. That can give you information of like your neighbors to see like how well your neighbors are doing, and you can get a better and more informed decision than just using the agent without the neighbors itself. But you also mentioned it also affect the 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 learning, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the learning with the memory retrieval model, the learning also you can see this green arrow. The learning is impacted over here also. Like how we encode our neighbors, all this is also learned jointly. When so so can I say that is if we ignore if we to ignore the the inference part, then it's very similar. I just want to confirm that. Ah uh, yes, if you ignore the inference part, then as what we mentioned at the beginning, 
using this um, memory augmented thing uh, to train only this main network here is very similar to like DQN's replay buffer or like prioritized experience replay. It, yeah, the only, right, difference okay, is I... that, the only difference is that um, in those replay buffers, usually we store transitions. But over here, this memory, we don't store transitions. We store like bot states and their metadata, which is like, what's the next moves and so on. Is okay. I mean, you can simplify it to be transitions as well. So I guess in the basic state, yes, it's about transitions, and yes, it's about using memory to train this agent to become to make it better. Yeah, if you talk only about the baseline agent itself, then the memory augmented buffer, sort of like a memory buffer. Yeah, I, I guess you could treat it that way. Okay. So yeah, but how how do you find this paper? Like, do you think that this paper has like potential, or or you think this is is too constrained a, a problem? I don't know. Like, I, it's a very new idea to me, so I I don't have much thought about it yet. But I I do find the idea that you you make use of your past experiences, the good ones during your during inference time, is something quite novel. I didn't I haven't seen anything like that. Before. Yeah, I think the key idea is that if you have good experiences, you should leverage on them. And because neural network weights kind of may forget stuff because after you update, you know, you catastrophic forgetting and so on. So it might be better to use an external memory to store these examples and experiences so that you can you can preserve the information in them. So I think that's the main idea. Using the memories as a way to to learn fast and also use it to like make sure that the data doesn't get corrupted because neural networks sometimes might forget. Yeah, so this is definitely something that I think will be the focus of a lot more works in the future. I can foresee this branch of using like memory to augment networks will, uh, to be quite powerful for a lot of different architectures. Okay, yep, if not, uh, I think I'd like to end here today. Thanks for coming and I'll see you all again like next week. Okay. Bye. Uh, thanks for sharing. Yep, no problem.